just want to start by, by looking at where our country is today as it relates to debt to our gross domestic product. Uh, most co countries in the world look at the amount of debt that they have as a country in relation to the gross domestic product that the country has. That's the sum of all the output. And for a lot of business people who may be tuned in today, uh, it's not unlike a company that looks at its revenues and compares the amount of debt that the company has to those revenues or gross profits. And so today, our country's debt to GDP is at 62% debt to gross domestic product. And I think most of us understand the problem that we have as a country today is that we are very rapidly moving to 146% of debt to GDP within the next 20 years. And I'd like to point out the reason this dot is here that is where Greece was when the European Union had to come in and bail it out. It was at 120% of GDP. And I don't want to compare our country to Greece. Greece is very different. I was just there visiting with the prime minister, their finance minister, and central bankers. There's much about their economy that is very different than ours. But I do think it's important to look at the fact that they were at 100% of debt to GDP when they had to be bailed out by European Union members, we are quickly moving beyond that over the next 20 years. Um, I think we're going to do this a little more quickly. This is a slide that uh, I hope uh, everybody who may be tuned in will focus on and remember there's three important components. It begins by looking at the revenues, which is the blue line. The spending is the red line. And there are three elements of this that I'd like for people to focus on, if they would. For those people who think that uh, Republicans and Democrats cannot work together, I do want to point out a period of time when we had a Democratic president and a Republican Congress, and the line actually passed. We had revenues that were higher than our expenditures. I do want to say that the fiscal issues during that time were far different than the ones that we have today. Where we are today in 2010 is far different. We have a huge gap between spending and revenues. And people might say, well, during a recession, uh, maybe there's some extraordinary things that may occur. Maybe the GDP uh, uh, spending to GDP rises tremendously. Maybe revenues drop. Here's the problem. And here's the part of the slide that I hope almost everybody uh, will focus on into the future. And that is that that gap never goes away. Where we are today is at 1.47 more in spending than we have in revenues. And the problem is that where we are as a country is that this gap never goes away. In 2020, we still are spending 1.25 trillion more than we're taking in. Let's go to the next slide. In Tennessee, the average household uh, in most recent data earned about 43,000 a year. Uh, if they use the kind of logic that we're using today in Washington, the average Tennessee household would spend $74,000. Uh, in other words, the average Tennessee household would borrow 40 cents for every dollar that they spend. Fortunately, that's not what's happening in Tennessee, or at least not with most families. So let's go to the next slide. I think when you look at a problem, you need to sort of look at trends that have taken place. And if you look at back in 1970, 62 percent of what we spent as a country was on what's called discretionary spending, things like defense, highways, and education. Only 31 percent of what we spent at that time was on mandatory spending, things like Medicare, Social Security, and Medicaid, and only 7 percent on interest. But if you fast forward to today, Obviously, that, that pie chart has changed dramatically. Today, we're spending in 2010 56% of what we take in on Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. Only 38% is going to discretionary spending, defense, highways, and education, and again, 6% to interest payments. However, if you fast forward on the present trend that we're on, you see that mandatory spending actually becomes crowded out. It's 49% of what we expend in 2035. And by that time, because of the large amount of borrowing that is taking place, 25% of what our budget will be made up of is interest payments, uh, things that, something that has absolutely nothing to do with making our country stronger. And as you can see, 
only 26% of our spending would then be on things like defense, highways, education, things entitled discretionary spending. So let's go to the next slide. This year, we spent $187 billion on interest payments, which greatly dwarfs what we spent in the area of transportation, $69 billion, Homeland Security, $49 billion, Department of Education, $45 billion. The problem is that if you fast forward to 10 years, and this is a time frame that's not way out into the future, this is something that most Americans can, can focus on, that's a decade from now. In 10 years, $916 billion will be going out of the federal coffers to pay interest. Again, hugely dwarfing expenditures on transportation, on homeland security, and education. I used to borrow a lot of money in my business. I, I built and owned buildings around our country, and it was always important to know who I was borrowing money from and to have a proper relationship with them. Uh, it's also interesting, I think, to look at our country and where we're borrowing the money that we're spending. And if you go back and look in 1960, uh, Americans loaned the American government money. Our parents, maybe some of you in the audience, uh, loaned money to the federal government by buying treasury bonds. As a matter of fact, back in 1960, only 5% of the money that we borrowed in this country came from foreign holders. But if you look at today, the picture is very, very different. As a matter of fact, today, 47% of the public debt that we borrow in this country is held by foreign holders. Now look, I understand about international trade and and global transactions and certainly uh, support that, have been a part of that in the past. The reason I point this out is that, uh, again, a big part of what we're borrowing is from others. China holds almost 10% of our debt. I think most of you saw recently where they slightly depressed the amount of holdings they had in the U.S., dropping it from about $870 billion uh, to 844. I, I do want to point out something that uh, former Treasury Secretary Paulson talked about in a book that he just recently wrote about the crisis. I used to talk with him sometimes on the weekends. Obviously, he was working seven days a week, as do I and most of us in this body. And I talked to him a, a great deal of time. And he remem I remember him telling me during the time of the crisis that he was concerned about China. He was concerned about China. And in the book, he talks about feeling that there was a scheme that Russia was trying to get China to engage in to get them to stop buying our securities during the period of time that we were most destabilized in order to put greater pressure on our country during a time of great turmoil. Obviously, that did not happen. But all I would say is I think it's important when you're moving into a range of having more indebtedness than you can handle, it's very important to know and understand that you're borrowing money from people who may not have the same interests that we as a country have. Let's go to the next slide. Now this is something that uh, you don't see often in this body, but I hope everybody will focus on this slide. The fact is there's plenty of blame to go around. We do a great job in this body, especially a few weeks before election, uh, pointing fingers at each other, talking about whose fault it is that our country is in the situation that it's in. But as it relates to our country's indebtedness, uh, I can assure you there's plenty of blame to go around. And what I learned in my business where I spent most of my life, whenever we had an ox in the ditch, it really didn't do a lot of good to try to point fingers at how we got there. It was better to try to focus on how we solve that problem. I certainly knew that as mayor of the city of Chattanooga, and I can tell you in this body, as soon as we begin devolving to pointing fingers, we quickly move away from solving uh, some of the major problems that we have as a country. So let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> so I think as we look at trying to deal with this issue, it's good to look at uh, it's sort of the way things have been. Over the last 50 years, our country on average has spent about 20.3% of our gross domestic product, our government, excuse me, has spent about 20.3% of our gross domestic product. Over that same period of time, the revenues 
into the federal government has been about 18 percent. Now let me say there are economists on both sides of the aisle that say as long as the economy is growing, you can continue that in perpetuity. Now, coming from the background that I come from, this is not a comfortable situation. I'd rather see us take in the same amount of money that we expend, but I just want to say that certainly there are academic, uh, academicians and economists on both sides of the aisle that, that certainly have different points of view. So let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> What is the right amount of spending that should take place in our country? I think that everybody's aware that President Obama has put together a deficit reduction commission. And it's chaired by two individuals. One of those is Erskine Bowles, who was chief of staff to Bill Clinton. Uh, he's a Democrat. He ran for the United States Senate from North Carolina. I've talked to him extensively on the phone. Uh, he certainly uh, has a lot of sound ideas. The other is Alan Simpson, who used to be a senator from Wyoming. They are chairing a deficit reduction commission that the president has put together. I think a great breakthrough occurred just recently when Erskine Bowles said that he feels like the federal government ought to spend about 21% of our country's gross domestic product. Again, our average over the last 50 years has been 20.3%. Our revenues over the last 50, uh, 50 years has been have been 18%. So Bob Corker, because he's more maybe conservative on that front or would like to see us balance and balance, actually I think there's a lot of people on both sides of the aisle that would like to see that. My number might be 18%, okay? Erskine Bowles has thrown out the number of 21. But to me, somewhere between 18 and 21, there's a deal. And I just want to say to everybody in this body that I am open to negotiation. I'd love for us to agree as a country as to what percentage of our gross domestic product we all agree as a country is the right number for us in Washington to be spending. And it seems to me if we can focus on this first, page one, we can move away from many of the issues that seem to separate us. Let's go to the next slide. This is something that I hope uh, everybody who may be tuned in will greatly focus on because the fact is I don't think we have thought about this deficit issue as something that is anything more than academic. I think we've thought about it as something that's going to affect a Congress down the road. It's going to affect maybe our neighbor, but it's not going to affect us. In order to get to Bob Corker's number, okay, over the next decade, which is which is a period of time I think most of us can focus on, we would have to cut spending over the next decade by $6.7 trillion, okay? That is a lot of money. To get to the number that Erskine Bowles had thrown out, okay, which again, I'm open to negotiation, but to get to his number over the next decade, we would have to cut 3.4 trillion dollars in spending. And to get where we've been over the last 50 years, over the next decade, we would have to cut four and a half trillion dollars in spending. And the reason I point this out is this is a huge number. Even by federal government standards, U.S. federal government standards, these numbers are draconian. As a matter of fact, let's go to the next slide. I realize this is something that's probably not attainable. To get $6.7 trillion in cuts, we'd have to cut $670 billion a year over the next 10 years. And just to put that in perspective so that people can digest it, this is more money than we spend each year on Medicare. This is more money than we spend each year on the fence with two wars. So the type of cuts that it would take to get to where we've been as a country for the last 50 years those cuts are draconian, and I don't think we as a Congress have quite come to terms with that yet. Let's go to the next slide. What I think we need to do is we have to fundamentally change the way that uh, we do business here in Washington. I don't care what side of the aisle uh, we may sit on or what gimmicks uh, each side of the aisle may put forth to look at trying to constrain spending. I think all of us know that we have absolutely no construct to constrain spending. Um, we're operating this year without a budget. Um, 
We've had, we've had problems with spending for decades, and there's nothing here that causes us to focus on it in the right way. And again, I think both sides of the aisle have had great problems in this regard. So let's go to the next slide. I think what we need to do as a body, as a Senate, and as a Congress, is to create a construct that forces us to cap spending and incentivize growth. I plan on offering uh, legislation later this year. I realize that this is a political season and that nothing serious is going to be taken up. But what I want us to do as a body is to focus on the amount of spending that we deal with in Washington as a percentage of our gross domestic product, as I've been laying out, and to develop a construct that causes us over time to move to that cap. I realize we're not going to be able to do it overnight, but it seems to me that if we can adopt that kind of thinking, where we look at governmental spending as a percentage of GDP, and again, I want to say that Erskine Bowles, uh, who's working right now as head of this Deficit Reduction Commission, to me, he's made a major contribution by throwing out a number. And I want to say again, I'm open for negotiation, but to me, if we can focus on that kind of construct, it seems to me then it's in everybody's interest to hope that the gross domestic product grows. Because as the gross domestic product of our country grows, as our economy grows, the types of issues that we face as it relates to cutting spending are less difficult to deal with. So it seems to me that we'd be unified towards getting to a point that is appropriate as it relates to spending so that our indebtedness does not put us in the same kind of situation that Greece found itself in. But at the same time, after we've done that, then we could agree on policies that actually incentivize growth because as the economy grows, it's easier to deal with this issue. And I'll come to my conclusion. The fact is that this is becoming a cliche. I realize it's said over and over again, but we are, in fact, the first generation of Americans that are in a situation where we likely if we don't change our course of action, we'll leave the country in a lesser, in lesser good shape than we found it. As a matter of fact, we're going to leave the country in worse shape. Two minutes left. Thank you so much. Two minutes remaining. Thank you so much. I appreciate the, uh, the cue. The fact is, and I don't think there's anybody, anybody in this body that would consciously wake up and spend every day of their life taking lavish vacations, going to nice hotels, eating out at night, running that up on a credit card, running that up on a credit card, and then leaving that for their heirs to pay off. There's nobody in this body that would consider doing that. But that's exactly, that's exactly what we're doing right now in Washington because of the way that we are handling our fiscal affairs. We're running up a tab that our grandchildren, some of the children in this audience that have come in as part of students, they're going to be left to pay. I believe in American exceptionalism, okay? I think that we are, in fact, the greatest country that has ever existed and ever will. I think that the role that we play in this world creates all kinds of gains as it relates to citizens' way of life throughout the world. And I would hate to see us as a country end up so, not only because of the tremendous impact it would have on our citizens. We've seen what has happened with this financial crisis and what it, the distortions it has created throughout our economy, the hardships it has created for so many Americans. But I would hate for us as a country to be so diminished because of our indebtedness, so diminished so that we had to talk to our lenders about those austerity measures that we had to take as a country for them to continue to loan us some money. For us to be so diminished that we did not continue to play the exceptional role that we play in the world, the exceptional role we play in continuing to raise up Americans' dreams and wishes and continue to allow them to actually pursue that. Mr. President, I thank you for the time. I plan on offering legislation. I have a nine-page bill now. I know that there's no bills around here that get seriously considered that are nine pages. Uh, others, I know, will weigh in, but uh, Mr. President, I sure hope to work with people on both sides of the aisle to deal with what I believe is the most... Senators, the time that you requested is up.
Okay. Oh. If I could have 20 seconds. Without objection. Okay. Mr. President, uh, as I mentioned, I plan on uh, offering legislation later this year uh, or the first of this next Congress. I do hope that we as a Congress will deal with this issue in an appropriate way. I am looking to work with people on both sides of the aisle, and I thank you very much for your patience.